something you're listening to off Planet Radio. This is Off Planet Radio. It is indeed Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins, and it is uh, September the 4th, 2013, under the shadows of war in the United States. I can't shake the heaviness that I have tonight. We're not religious people here, uh, but we are spiritual, and however, whatever, wherever you honor a higher power, um, you need to seek peace, and we need to stop the warmongering bastards who have ridden roughshod over this world for thousands of years and continue to do so. Um, this is not good. And uh, we're going to talk about that in the second hour tonight. Uh, I have a added guest for it tonight in the second hour. We do announce all the uh, shows on the websites, which are offplanetradio.com for the main site, and offplanetradio.net, which is the site you are listening to the stream on. Our guest for the first hour tonight is David Weatherly, Black Eyed Children and Strange Intruders. He'll be up in a minute. And second hour tonight, um, I have coming on Dr. Alfred Lambermont Weber from exopolitics.com. And uh, we're going to talk about Syria. Barack Obama, and uh, some changes that need to be made in the world order such as it is today. And again, I can't stress enough, these are perilous times. Um, the dark feeling that I've had is ominously similar to what I had on September 10th, 2001, and uh, it feels that heavy again to me. And so we pray against war, and we strive for peace. Um, on the line with me right now is my co-host and uh, actually somebody that's become a very good friend as well, Chris Holly. Welcome this evening. Um, hello. How is everybody out there who's listening? And good evening, Randy. Hey, Chris. Um, we have a pretty interesting show tonight and uh, our first hour guest is with us on the line. David Weatherly is an author, paranormal investigator, and for 35 years he's explored the world of the strange, investing ca investigating cases around the country and abroad. He's written and lectured on a diverse range of topics, including cryptozoology, ufology, and hauntings. He's also studied shamanic and magical traditions with elders from numerous cultures, including Europe, Tibet, Native American and African cultures, and he has a, a, a pretty deep background in some things that I'm very interested in, including Nordic runes, and um, some of the topics that we're going to talk about in the next hour, Jinn, Slender Men, Black-Eyed Beings, and so much more. We welcome to Off Planet Radio, our guest for tonight, David Weatherly. Welcome to Off Planet Radio. Good evening. Thanks for having me on. Hey, it's good to good to have you on tonight. Um, your background is very interesting. You've been doing this for thirty five years. Tell us how you got started and uh, how you wound up going into exotic topics. The black eyed children thing for us is just you know that's the bomb. <laughs> uh, sure, we can get to that, but let me just throw something in, Randy. Uh, bravo for that uh, lead-in to the show tonight, because, you know, we're, we're really on the brink of some uh, serious changes in the world, and uh, the more people, you know, especially that are going on, on radio shows and, and any other type of media and speaking out uh, against the outrageous amount of war that this world is facing, it's, you know, it's all the better. It's, uh, it's just got to stop at some point. It really does. Thanks. I, I think we're all on the same so, uh, page here with that, David. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I just, uh, just like to have my voice in, just like everybody else. And, you know, the, the people, the more people that cry out against it, the better. 
Yeah, but, uh, all things. Yeah, all gonna... uh, let me just say this, because uh, th for the listeners and the people who will hear this later, uh, you think that we're ruled over by masters in this world, but we're only ruled over them because we've allowed it and because we haven't raised our voices. Protest is dead in this country, and it's time that people got their spines back, and it's time you started realizing that you intercede for your own future and for the future of this world. So thanks for thanks for bringing that up, David. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So... On to the more uh, fun and creepy stuff, I guess. <laughs> At least for now, right? <laughs> we um, love it. This, uh, you know, this, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a you guys want to jump right in, right? <laughs> Go ahead and give us your background first, David. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I got started in this uh, really when I was uh, very young. I was interested in unusual things and. Uh, I show my age a little bit here, but you know, when I was um, growing up in the seventies, I was just drawn to all, all things paranormal. And um, when I use that term, I use it in, in the broad scope, not just for haunted types, but UFOs and cryptozoology and ancient mysteries, just the whole spectrum. And uh, I grew up in a rural area of North Carolina. There really wasn't a whole lot of access to study these things at the time, and. Uh, you know, I found everything I could, you know, we didn't even have a bookstore in the town I grew up in. We just had some, some books at the drugstore or whatever. So I found things like Von Donneken's Church of the Gods and yeah. you know, that stuff that yeah. was coming out in the 70s. And it, it was fascinating, you know, very intriguing. But uh, I, I've said this lots of times, and, and I always say this, that when you're really drawn to these kind of things, you know, they tend to find you anyway. And what happened for me personally was that, uh, lo and behold, this older couple moved in very close to us. And uh, I went over and started visiting with them and found out that the woman was a spiritualist. And, uh, you know, the early 70s, I wasn't even sure what that was. I started talking to her and learning more about what she did and was interested in. And, uh, you know, she sort of explained the whole world of spiritualism and, and introduced me to that and then in the midst of it you know I, I'm visiting with her one day and she was reading Fate magazine and uh, this is a big turning point it sounds kind of silly to some people but you know she's Fate magazine was a little digest size magazine at the time and, yeah I remember uh, I seeing this, seen this. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I had never seen it before and I said wow what's this and uh you know this is I mean Fate in its heyday it really started in the, the late 40s but even in the 70s, it was just a wealth of information of, of everything from psychic phenomena to, to Bigfoot, haunted ties, everything you can imagine. And, and all the, the mainstream people in the field were writing for the publication at, at one point or other during that time. And uh, it was really cool because this woman, you know, she said, well, you make sure you come back and visit me tomorrow. And uh, when I went over there the next day, guys, she presented me with this huge box full of fake magazines. It's less than two years' worth. And she says, I don't need these anymore. Why don't you take them? And, uh, you know, my, my joke is that I was mysteriously too sick to go to school for about a week or so. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I just kind of barricaded in and, and just observed all this stuff. And I thought, wow, there's a whole world of people interested in the same things. And, and it's much more expansive than I could ever realize. And uh, so I never looked back from then. You know, I uh, have constantly just, Observed all the information that I could. I, I started actually investigating cases on my own when I was still a teenager. You know, formed a little team and just uh, you know a couple of other people. And back then, it, it was a real challenge to those to uh, investigate anything paranormal because you didn't just walk up to someone and start talking about ghosts or UFOs or anything like that. They think you were nuts. So. You know, <laughs> yes, I, really I can tell you from personal right. experience, they did think you were nuts. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it taught me a lot of uh, journalistic skills along the way because you had to learn how to really relate to people, you know, not just walk up and say, okay, give me the information, which unfortunately, you know, a lot of people involved in the paranormal today, it, it's it's incredibly simple, simple for them because people come to them and report a case and, and they just ask the questions. Uh, it's, it's not really... Uh, drawing the information out of people and, and really, you know, getting sort of down in the trenches and, and digging for the background and the history and all those types of things like it used to be. So that was sort of a foundation for me. You know, I, I um, 
started pursuing these things, like I said, in the 70s and, and just have always delved into this whole world of the strain, so to speak. Now, you've done a lot of traveling ar around the world and across the United States and, and kind of going into diverse cultures to draw from your material. Um, do you have a professional background that maybe doglegs into what you're doing with this? Is this your profession these days? This is this is pretty much what I do now. Yeah. Um, wow, that's great. I've just always uh, I've I've always done a, a variety of different things on the side, but um, you know, currently right now this takes up all my time and has for the last several years. And uh, yeah, I, I've really explored different cultures, and you know, I have a shamanic background, which you know, initially when I started pursuing those things. When I was younger, I, I sort of thought at first that it was a separate track, but I quickly realized, no, it's really not. Uh, these things are all sort of married together and, and interweave because these traditional cultures have a, a very different view on the supernatural or the paranormal. You know, it's, it's uh, more of an accepted part of their reality. So the dynamic is different when you go into those cultures because the people are more open-minded. You know, they're not uh, closed down by what's considered the cultural norm, and so forth. So it really gives you a different perspective on a lot of this phenomena and how it integrates into their individual cultural beliefs. Uh, and that's, that's, a pretty, that's been a pretty significant thing for me because I think it's given me a unique perspective over the years. You know, I have a sense, and you just kind of drew this out as you, I was listening to you talk, we need these ancient cultures to understand these things there's a partition in the Western mindset that we call things paranormal and supernatural that in other cultures are simply accepted as part of the natural order. Is that your experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's pretty fascinating to me because over the years, what I've experienced is seeing a lot of more traditional uh, shamanistic beliefs sort of come to light in the scientific world. And what I mean by that, to be clear, is, for instance, you can go to ancient cultures all over the world and you'll find some version of an idea of the energy body or yes, the yes. human energy yeah. field. And, you know, it's, you go to Asia, it's called chi. You go to, you know, uh, it's prana in India, it's mana in Hawaii. So you, you find this all over the world. And, <clears throat> of course, you know, modern science has always scoffed at that idea. I don't know, no such thing, blah, blah, blah. Until the late 90s, um, scientists came out with this grand announcement. Oh, we've discovered that the human body has an energy field. <laughs> and it, it, it's sort of, you know, it, it's sort of laughable in a way because you've got all these people saying, oh, okay, wow, that makes sense. They scientifically proved this. <laughs> and, uh, it's sort of silly because, you know, you've got these cultures that have been working for with it for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, I think that as we progress with the quantum sciences, you're going to see yeah, more and more absolutely. of that yeah. Yeah. come through because, you know, the quantum scientists uh, are, are really scientists who reach sort of a finite point with the standard scientific process and started looking beyond and the you know a lot of these guys I've talked to a lot of quantum scientists and some of these people they would never consider themselves spiritual but at the same time there's some of the most spiritual people you would meet because they're really reaching beyond that uh, you know standard set of scientific ideas and, and sort of reaching into the void so to speak well in about five seconds Nils Bohr and Carl Schrodinger don't sound so insane now because we see what they tapped into from the scientific side and the whole quantum thing, which has been around for a long time, but we re hasn't been mainstream science. It's still not really taught in, in public school systems is actually where we kind of slide over into that, that woo-woo area that the paranormal, the supernatural have been tapping into for a long time. That's right. That's right. And some of it is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a scientist, but uh, some of it is very fascinating, and I, I try to keep tabs on some of this to see, you know, how it is winding around into the world of the paranormal, and it's pretty fascinating. Um, one of the things that's really intrigued me in the past, oh, uh, 10 years or so 
is this whole quantum idea of other dimensions of existence. Now, something that has fascinated me for, for many, many years is the idea of uh, what's considered a portal area. Yeah. You know, people call them window yeah. areas. Um, you know, I commonly use the term a portal area. And these are, are places around the planet that are that appear to be a concentrated area of high strangeness. Uh, for instance, the Skinwalker Ranch in, in the Uinta Basin of Utah, uh, the Superstition Mountains in Arizona, Canuck Chase in England. You find these in, in virtually every country. And what you'll find in this concentrated geographical area is a high number of UFO sightings, cryptid encounters, haunted sites, just a whole range of weird phenomena. And Native cultures, going back to this again, you know, have this whole concept of these being areas that are, you know, sometimes they're taboo, uh, like parts of the Superstition Mountains are taboo to the Native people, um, and, and you find a, a range of different beliefs. But what is fascinating is that, once again, you can go to cultures all over the world, and you'll find this idea that says that at some point, in another race or, uh, or several other races of beings existed on this planet with us. And at some point, they left. They either went through a shimmering doorway, or they went through a hole in the mountain, or in this whole range of different uh, ways, depending on the cultural viewpoint. But it's all the same concept. It's the idea that there was another race of beings here that left somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I think what these people are describing are portals to another dimension. And, you know... Even a few years ago, sometimes even now I talk about this and people are sort of shaking their heads saying, no way. But again, quantum science has come out with this idea and announced, hey, we've, uh, we've determined that there are 12 other dimensions. We don't know exactly what they look like or how to get to them, but we know they're there. Well, you know, the question I always pose is this, just because we can't get there, but what's to say that something there can't get here? And I, I think that this, accounts for a lot of the things that people are experiencing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in the world now with all these bizarre entity encounters. You know, I, I think that things are coming through dimensional doorways, so to speak. Uh, David, can I ask you a question? I, all, I yeah, agree sure. with you about all of this. And I have asked this question of other people, and they always you go, no, no, go away. You know, that with what you're saying... Couldn't it be the reason we cannot trap, find, catch, or or have the remains of a Bigfoot because they may be doing just that, coming in and out from another dimension? <laughs> I mean, why not? Well, you, well Chris, you know, that, you know why that gives people so worked up, right? Uh, you know, in the world of, of Sasquatch research, especially... Uh, there, there's a very hard dividing line. And on one side, you have people that are, are consider themselves the hard scientists. They firmly believe that this is a, a missing, you know, undiscovered primate of some type, uh, perhaps a descendant of Gigantopithecus or, or some type of North American ape that just hasn't been discovered. Uh, and, and they're very hard line about that. And the reason they stick to that is because they, they think that a physical discovery will be made. And any time you get into areas that step outside of, of what is considered, you know, normally feasible, uh, a lot of these people believe you lose credibility. Now, see, for see, some of those know. researchers, I understand that. You know, when you're, when you're somebody like, uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, you know, who's, a uh, a university professor, and he has to sort of, you know, stay within the line, so to speak, in order to do his research. But then on the other side of that line, you've got people who are claiming, you know, all kinds of crazy things, you know, psychic contact with Sasquatch and, and all these different things. And, you know, ultimately, this may prove to be indeed a, a physical living creature, but perhaps it has some kind of an instinctual ability to go through those portals or, you know, whatever it is. It, there, there may be on some level that it's able to move in and out of these things. There are not many researchers who will talk about that. Uh, Nick Redfern, a good friend of mine, is one who will go there. <laughs> you know, he, he only believes, and, and Nick and I have talked about this a lot, he just believes that there's something 
sort of paranormal about Sasquatch. Yeah, Nick's been on the show and, and so talked about the that. physical body. Yeah. Well, well, it's more logical to think that that's the case than to think that they're an animal that we just can't catch and and cannot find any form or sign of or remains of. That's illogical to me. So, you know, maybe I'm the one with the terrible problem, but it would be more logical to believe that they come and go at will to a place that we cannot follow them to. <laughs> and that's where we can you know, you know, <laughs> I, well, you know, I, I'm really open to both possibilities. I mean, when you consider historically a couple of things, one is uh, the mountain gorilla was a myth for, for a very long time. And... You know, that was in a very small region, but people were convinced that it was just a, a folk tale and, you know, tribal superstition and so forth until one was finally captured. Um, you know, with North America, we're looking at a vast amount of space. And here, here's the thing that people don't commonly understand. You know, almost everyone lives in a city or at least a small town. And there's this false perception that, Humans have been all over all of North America, but it's simply not true. There are vast amounts of wild area in this country. I mean, uh, Utah alone is, is a great example, because if you look at the state of Utah on a map, mm-hmm. there's one main interstate that goes right up the center of Utah, and something like uh, 75 to 80 percent of the populace of the state lives along that corridor. Utah's a big state. There's a lot of mountainous areas, there's a lot of forests, there's a lot of wild space that humans simply don't occupy most of the time. And, you know, when you start looking at some of these, um, you know, you pick a place like that and you start looking at some of the Bigfoot reports, you'll find that they do happen way out in the wild and, and it was you know, cited by someone who was uh, hiking a trail or camping or, or doing these types of things. So it's certainly conceivable. And like I said, I'm, I'm open to both possibilities. Let me, let me follow that up um, because you, you bring a good point up and you've connected the Sas- Sasquatch to uh, portals. And one of my theories has been that the reason why we don't see them in, in environs close to our civilization isn't because the Sasquatch is necessarily um, shying away from humanity, although they probably are, and with good reason, but that our own energetic fields put off by civilization have basically repelled these portal areas. Do you have any thoughts about that, David? That's a possibility. I mean, as far as the Sasquatch is concerned... I think that, you know, in some of the reports, it appears that they have adapted somewhat Mm -hmm. um, when there are, you know, large amounts of of populace encroaching upon their space and and so forth. You get these reports of Sasquatch, you know, rooting in trash cans and things like that. But no, for the most part, I I agree with you. I think that they try to avoid civilization for the most part. Uh, There's a lot of things to consider. I mean, the rate at which... um, you know, we've expanded things in this country alone. For instance, you know, our Wi-Fi services yeah. popped up everywhere. Um, you know, the, the electrical grid, you know, EMF fields. All of these things affect animals. They affect humans, too. We just don't uh, really pay attention to it. But animals have a higher degree of sensitivity for these things. So they're very likely to, you know, gravitate away from those things because it probably uh, bothers them or, or hurts them or something to some degree. So it's going to force them more into the wilderness. Now, as far as how the, um, you know, our growth is affecting the portal areas, that's a really interesting question. It, it's very hard to document. We just don't have enough evidence at this point. But, you know, you do see areas that are known portal areas, and when outside influences are introduced, Strange things happen. Uh, you know, the Skinwalker Ranch yeah, um, yeah. is a great example. Uh, and you start looking at the research team going in there and introducing things, you know, like uh, even as simple as cameras, you know, mounted cameras and, and surveillance equipment and things like that. It, it's affecting that field somehow. And we just don't know exactly what the results are going to be. Before we leave the wilderness, and the um, <laughs> the Skinwalker Ranch also, Mr. Bigelow's home uh, land. Let's um, 
bring in the black eyed children, David, and how do you think they fit into all of this? And what are they? What do they want? You know, where do you think they're coming from? Well, first of all, for anyone who hasn't heard of this phenomenon, it, uh, it essentially has, it, it's something that's grown at an alarming rate. There are reports literally coming from all over the world on, on a regular basis now. Uh, there are a number of researchers that I, I know personally who are tracking these accounts and, you know, they hear these things on a daily basis. They're hearing different accounts than the ones I get. Uh, people are, are seeing these things everywhere. And, um, uh, a basic encounter is that, of, uh, you know, someone being at home alone and hearing a knock on the door. It's, it's usually a, a very long, drawn-out knock that just doesn't stop until a person answers the door. Uh, they go to the door and they find a child standing there, sometimes just a pair of them, usually in the age range of anywhere from 8 to early teens. The age I hear most commonly is about 10 years old. And uh, these children will be standing on the steps and looking down at their shoes or something, and, and there will uh, be a very strange dialogue that takes place. You know, these children will say, hey, uh, we just wanted to stop by. Why don't you invite us in? And it's still living in a very cold, monotone voice. Uh, the victim is usually obviously confused because they, they've never seen these children before. And, you know, they try to dialogue with these kids to find out, you know, are, are you lost? Where are your parents? And, and ask logical questions that any of us would ask. Uh, but these children will just keep repeating the same things over and over again. And at some point, these kids will look up and make eye contact, at which point the person realizes that these children have solid black eyes. Now, this is not just the people. It's the entire square. The entire eye is solid black. Uh, much like the depiction of the alien grays that is so ingrained in people's minds. Their skin is usually very pale, sort of pasty, and uh, they typically dress in very drab clothing, you know, browns and grays. And the reaction from the victim it is one of outright fear. Now, usually what happens is that in a typical encounter is that the person is initially nervous and uneasy, uh, it, it quickly goes to, you know, a very nervous and anxious state. And once that eye contact is made, it sort of pushes them over the edge into uh, a state of fear that causes the flight response to kick in. So the people will typically, you know, slam their door and lock it or drive away if the encounters in the parking lot and so forth. And uh, all they can think about is just getting away from these kids as, as quickly as possible. So it, it's a very creepy encounters um there are uh, sightings from you know law enforcement personnel and, and just a, a wide range of people um all over the country i i got involved in it because in the um early 2000s i met a gentleman who had experienced a pair of these kids himself and uh this guy was, you know, I call him a John Wayne character. He was a prison guard and, and just a real no BS guy. And, uh, you know, didn't believe in anything paranormal, but had an experience with a pair of these kids that just scared him to death. And, uh, you know, it took him a long time to try to come to terms with what he had experienced. And uh, typically these kids will vanish very suddenly. You know, there are accounts of, of law enforcement officers having trying to have a dialogue with them and, and turning around just for a moment to knock on the door, turning back, and these kids have vanished. So, you know, I wrote the book to explore the different possibilities of what these things could be because, oddly enough, when you start looking at the cases, what you find is that they have uh, traits in common with a wide range of paranormal phenomena. And you could make an argument that they're alien hybrids, which is what a lot of people believe. You could argue that they're some kind of demonic entity, um, uh, some kind of a spirit or a ghost. So all these things are sort of explored in the book, and I really leave it up to people to determine for themselves what they think, you know, the evidence supports the best. My personal opinion goes back to what we were talking about earlier, in that I believe there's some type of interdimensional being that's, stepping to and through into our world. David, has there ever been a case 
uh, reported where the people did let them in that we know what happened? Because there has there to be people... They... Yeah, um, you know, there's, there's been a number of those showing up, and people are sending them to me all the time that are uh, showing up on the Internet and other people are reporting them and so forth. Um, there's only been a, a small handful that I investigated myself that uh, people purported to have let one in. And the one case that I was really able to examine pretty closely is documented in the book. It's pretty long, long account. It takes up a full chapter, as a matter of fact. Um, so, you know, rather than, I don't think we really have time to go into that tonight, but uh, it was very, very few cases. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. I said they did survive it, though. Yes, their they account did. with the children. Well, what, what do you think they want from? Well, sorry, it, it seems overall. Let me let me add this about the the last question. It, it seems overall that the closer the proximity one gets to these children, the the worse the results are. So, for instance, oh. there have been people that have uh, reached out and touched one of these kids. Uh, there have been a couple of people who have been touched by one of them. And, you know, a lot of these cases, it, it almost appears that these kids are some type of uh, omen. And that right after their appearance, a, a whole series of, of unfortunate events will occur to the person who had the encounter. And a few of those cases have been... Uh, so bad. And there have been a few cases where someone has encountered the black eyed children, and very soon afterwards, a, a family member will pass away. So it's sort of a, a chicken or the egg debate. You know, do these kids actually bring the ill fortune and, and sort of uh, cause it because of their presence, or are they an omen that these negative things are going to happen? It's, it's really difficult to say. Wow, that's so interesting. Before we do let time get away from us, let's talk about your book, Strange Intruders. Tell us about it and explain to us the, um, you know, creatures that you write about. Sure. Well, that's the new book that just came out last month. And uh, it covers a, a wide range of essentially entity encounters. I covered a couple of things that I've been asked about constantly over the past year. Uh, Black Eyed Children came out last year, and it's it's really interesting because two things that always seem to come up over the past year were the gym and uh, the Slender Man. And uh, there are some phenomena miles apart, but uh, they're both included in the book. The Slender Man... You know, a lot of your listeners may be familiar with this, uh, quote, phenomena. It's actually an entity that was created on the Internet. And it was uh, created through a forum contest. But what's bizarre about uh, the Slender Man is that so many people support the idea that this thing is real to some degree that, you know, people are believing they're having encounters with this entity. Uh, you know, Coast to Coast AM has received frantic calls of people, you know, claiming to have encountered a Slender Man-like entity. So this may be a case of some other type of paranormal entity utilizing the idea and the energy to present itself to people. Uh, it could also get into the, the territory of the Tulpa, which is something I, I know we were talking about briefly off off air. Is is you know I lived in Germany in the seventies, early early seventies. They used to talk about a creature. They called him the Tall Man, I think. Is mm. is, is that a relation to this, the Slender Man? He was this tall, skinny creature that they were all afraid of, and I didn't yeah, understand you, a lot yeah. of what they were telling. Me. Uh, right, you know it's it's interesting because it, it also. Uh, you may be thinking too of the dark man, uh, the force man in German that uh, is, you know, purportedly a very old German idea about this essentially a tall, creepy figure that lurks in the in the dark and in the woods and uh, causes disappearances in a wide range of other people. A lot of that mythos was yeah. sort of married into the Slender Man idea when yeah. it was created. And, you know, for people who don't know the Slender Man, uh, 
there's a forum called Something Awful. And essentially what happened was someone presented the idea of a contest. And they said, uh, hey, I, I love paranormal topics, and here's a contest. Uh, everyone is challenged to create a paranormal um, uh, video or, you know, concept and present it here on the forum. And the idea is that you have to make it real enough so that we can make it go viral on the Internet and make people believe that it's a real phenomenon. So, you know, and of course, as paranormal investigators, we hate this kind of stuff because it's a big waste of time, you know, uh, for people like us who are trying to, you know, get to the real encounters and everything. But what happened in this particular case was a wide range of people started posting all kinds of, you know, made up creatures and cryptids and all kinds of things. But someone came up with this idea of uh, this tall, slender man who's sort of lurked in the background. He's depicted with no face and multiple arms, and, you know, he's, he's uh, responsible for strange tragedies and disappearances and so forth. And it, the idea was so subtle and and had such an edge of creepiness. It, it was sort of like the, the monster under the bed in its vagueness. And it, it really caught people's attention. And as a result, uh, the, the whole thread just became about this figure, which eventually came to be called the Slender Man. And, you know, people were just contributing to it left and right. Uh, a series of video logs called Marble Hornets began to be created and, and posted on the Internet. So... This thing, it, it really did become viral. And in the midst of that, weaving in and out of that, were these ideas that related to a much older mythology, you know, the dragging in different pieces of things to contribute to it. And it, it, it's grown into something that really has sort of moved beyond the bounds of what it originally was. And it, it's, there's a very disturbing edge to it because, you know, we may be seeing something that is, is being co-created before our eyes because the the concept of a, a tulpa, for people who aren't familiar with that term, uh, a tulpa tulp is a Tibetan term and it essentially is a concept that being can be created from pure thought all the way into the physical form. And uh, it's a pretty fascinating area of, of research uh, you know, it links to Tibetan mysticism and a lot of other traditions. So in the Western world, some people might recognize that as, as a thought form, you know, something that is initially pure thought, but eventually begins to take physical form. And the thing with the Slender Man is that you have so many people around the world at this point contributing to what they believe is the reality of this idea uh, that, um, you know, we're seeing a, a vast pool of negative energy perhaps collecting into a solid concept to some degree. Now, as I said before, this may be a result of people experiencing some other entity that they're identifying as a slum man. It may be, you know, something that uh, is so strong that it's causing people to hallucinate. It's difficult to say, but uh, again, it's, it's a very creepy concept. It certainly is. And, and you also write about the jinn, yes? Yes, there's a whole chapter on the jinn in uh, Strange Intruders. And this is uh, something that's become a, a pretty pretty hot topic in the last few years. Uh, Rosemary Guiley has written a couple of books on the jinn, and she really explored it pretty extensively. Uh, the jinn, of course, come from uh, the uh, Middle East. <laughs> now, commonly in the West, uh, we use the term genie. Unfortunately, most people hear that term and they think one of a couple of things. They think of the, the fat silly guy from the Disney movies. Uh, you know, if you're a little bit older, you might think of Barbara Eden in the, the harem costume, you know, bumbling right. around. But uh, when you start studying the, quote, reality of the jinn, you'll find that it's a much darker world. You know, the origins of the jinn relate back to... Uh, uh, essentially a creation type mythos, the idea that uh, God, or since it's the Middle East, Allah created three races of beings. He created uh, humans, he created angels, and he created jinn. And as things unfolded in that world, uh, the jinn were ordered to essentially acknowledge 
the rulership, so to speak, of humans, uh, their superiority. And the jinn refused to do this. As a result, they were banished. And now this kind of comes full circle of what we were talking about earlier, because here we're getting into this idea of, of portals and so forth again. Uh, there's this idea that the jinn were somehow banished, but they're still part of this world, oddly enough. So when you go to the Middle East, and even parts of Asia, you'll hear a lot of things about the jinn and this concept that they can dwell anywhere. You know, uh, depending on the region, they will be um, attached to abandoned buildings or uh, very remote places. You know, there are famous sites that, uh, for instance, Petra, the ruins of Petra, are purportedly filled with jinn. And at night you can hear their voices and hear things uh, coming out. And these are all areas that uh, are uh, very strong spots for the jinn to dwell, but they also will look for opportunities to interfere with humankind. Now, this sort of takes a couple of different directions. On one scale, we hear stories where they're more trickster-like, and, uh, for instance, they will you know, offer their services and so forth, but they won't exactly give you what have you asked for? You know, they're very tricky with how they interpret your words. And that's sort of the, the lesser degree of how much they will interfere to a, a deeper, uh, more sinister degree. They will actually you know, drain people's energies. They will cause uh, large amounts of, of chaos and destruction and essentially try to destroy people. Now, one of the reasons this has become a big topic, I think, in the Western world <laughs> is that because the United States military in particular has had so much involvement in the Middle East uh, for a number of years now. We've got a lot of veterans that are coming back from places like Iraq, and they're bringing souvenirs with them. And, you know, we're seeing cases where people will bring back a, a piece of jewelry or something they, they picked up or bought, bought in a market and so forth. And these items can have a gin attached to them. Oh, yeah. What will happen typically is, you know, the person will experience either uh, physical difficulties, uh, sicknesses, and so forth. And in extreme cases, we'll have people who are experiencing, for instance, poltergeist-like activity in their home. You know, this destructive energy that's attached to this object will start causing chaos in the home uh, in order to... Um, you know, fulfill it, it's uh, what it enjoys doing, fulfill its mission. So they do. Can they cleanse themselves of the, of the jinn if they have that attachment? Is there a way to get rid of it? They can. Yeah, they can. Now, typically, in a situation like that, the best thing to do is to obviously search the object that the jinn is attached to and deal with it directly. So, you know, we're getting into sort of a quote, haunted of the left object territory. And, you know, depending on the intensity of it, uh, there are different ways to deal with that. Obviously, the best thing to do is to remove the object from the home. Have and have someone who is a, um, a priest of your particular faith deal with it. Uh, I worked with a Sufi man for quite some time who uh, does extensive work dealing with the jinn. And uh, the number of cases that he gets are, are very, very high at this point, both in the United States and the U.K. Again, a lot of that is attributed to uh, military personnel coming back from the Middle East. Oh, gee. That's, that's an incredible thing to know. Well, these, stories, you, um, these stories of these objects, I, I, does yeah. anybody remember when we initially went into Baghdad, one of the first things that happened was an incursion into the museum in Baghdad, and the persistent rumors have been at that time that the military <laughs> was sent on a mission to find certain power objects, much like when Hitler was looking for the Holy Grail during World War II. Do you see any uh, crossover? Uh, between oh, all that? oh yeah, a absolutely, absolutely, and you know, people people think this is uh, science fiction or fantasy. Or no, no, it really is not. Uh, Hitler had an entire occult bureau that was tasked with traveling the world and retrieving 
various objects of power, so to speak. So, you know, it's well known that Hitler was seeking the grail, he was seeking the, the spear of Londinus, and all these sacred uh, relics from different traditions around the world. And, you know, you see that portrayed in, in the first uh, Indiana Jones movie, and a lot of people think, oh, that's that's silly, you know, the, uh, that, that's just fun, you know, the, the government's storing it in a warehouse somewhere. But no, you're absolutely right, Randy, when, when the first Iraq invasion took place, I certainly took note of that, and there is very, very little record of that happening, and there's certainly no record that's traceable of what happened to the objects and what exactly they took. Uh, that's a big question for me, you know, because there were rumors for a long time that uh, Hussein was storing different power objects in that museum. And, you know, face it, the man was in power for a very long well, this time. This was a man who was so, rebuilding you know, Babylon at the time. And, exactly, um, exactly. I can recall there are actually accounts in the ancient Hebrew scriptures about objects that were brought back from the battlefield during the time that Israel was uh, at war with the uh, the Hittites and all the other foreign nations, and certain objects were brought back into camp, and there were curses upon the people that are recounted mm-hmm. in the scriptures. Now, we're going back, yeah. what, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, and the, these are not unusual tales of cursed objects that, uh, well, there's a very heavy price to be paid for them. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, even since biblical times, we've heard these constant stories of uh, some type of, you know, power objects, yeah. essentially, yeah. that people have sought out. And, you know, the the trail certainly goes, goes cold a lot of the times, but... You know, there, there are a vast number of them in the Bible. Um, you know, I would the Ark of the Covenant. But then there are other items that people don't think about. You know, for instance, uh, the um, the horn of uh, Joshua. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a, a whole range of other, quote, objects that we don't really know what they were. Uh, you know, they were described through the cultural lens of the time as to what they did, but... You know, reading them in a, a modern perspective, they sound like some type of very powerful weapon. And it would be, you know, natural for a lot of uh, crazed world leaders to seek these things out. So I, I think that this continues to go on behind the scenes. I absolutely do. There, If you look at the end of World War II, there are a lot of various rumors about uh, some of the different things that Hitler had created and, and where they disappeared and how they disappeared and so forth. And, you know, we just don't know. Um, every once in a while, something will turn up. You know, I don't know if you guys heard a couple of, oh, I guess it was last year, maybe, this, or maybe it's 2011, um, a crystal skull was found in Bavaria. And this skull, it's, it's been nicknamed the German skull. Uh, a journalist was pursuing some historical research, he found the widow of an SS officer living in this little house in Bavaria. And when he started having meetings with this woman, he ended up finding a full-size crystal skull that was tucked away on a beam inside of her house. And with it was um, some paperwork. And essentially the story was that her husband had been an SS officer who was tasked with getting certain objects out of Germany during the fall. And he hid that skull there, and it had been there since, you know, 1945. So it makes you wonder what else is hidden and, and where is it. Now, that, that skull, the last I heard of, has a test for being run on it and so forth to determine its, its point of origin and so forth. Uh, but it had been collected. It was an item that was collected by Hitler's occult bureau. So the terrible fear is, where are these things now, and who ha- you know who has them, and that could be a real serious problem for this world. Um, yeah, it, it sure could. I mean, especially with what we're facing now. You know, these yeah. constant wars in the Middle East, and you know what. Uh, you know, who's holding these things has sort of been a up sleeve. Oh, my goodness. Well, before we just get lost um, here, David, tell us about this new book you're working on and 
what is the subject matter exactly? Because you threw me with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we referenced it briefly. Uh, the the subject matter is uh, tulpas, and the book is called uh, Tulpas, Thought Forms in the Web of Life. And it, it explores in depth this concept of the tulpa. This is a, a very fascinating area to delve into, uh, to give you um, one perspective on it. Uh, there was a woman named Alexandra David Niel, who's a Belgium explorer. And uh, back in the 1900s, this woman, she did some amazing things. I can't believe a, a movie's never been made about this woman. Uh, she went into Tibet. Now, at the time, you know, uh, Lhasa was a forbidden city. Tibet was a forbidden kingdom. Westerners just didn't go in there, let alone uh, female Westerners. But this woman did. And not only that, but she became very close to some of the high lamas in Tibet. She uh, began to uh, undertake training with some of these people. And the story that she tells in, in one of her numerous books on her journeys in Tibet <clears throat> was that she had met an artist. And uh, this gentleman was a, an incredible artist of Tibetan motifs. And she had not seen him for a while. He came into, into camp, and this is in Tibet, and he was a very different person. He was rather paranoid. He believed he was being followed. He was seeing this uh, specter of... of some type of entity that was following him. And when she pressed him for more information, he told her that this particular spirit was following him was the spirit of a Tibetan deity that he had become obsessed with painting and focusing on. And had just uh, done this repeatedly over and over until he started to see a manifestation of this uh, entity. Now, after the artist left, Alexander was so intrigued with the idea that she went to the Lamas and she said, what exactly is he talking about? Because he referenced the idea of a tulpa. And the Tibetan said, oh, yes, a tulpa is an ancient, uh, you know, mystical thing that can be created. And she said, I, I don't understand. They essentially told her that through a specific series of meditations and uh, focuses that a, a being could be created out of pure thought. And she was so intrigued by the idea that she decided to attempt it. And in order to <clears throat> make this as, as um, unrestricted as possible and, and not uh, fall into the trap of any you know, cultural imaginings or anything, she decided that she wouldn't imagine anything Tibetan, that she would focus on uh, sort of a fire cut looking character. It was Jolly Old Monk uh, that was, you know, European-style monk. So she started doing this practice that the lamas gave her. And after a period of doing this, she begins to see essentially a ghost, uh, a ghostly image of this monk. And as she continues the practice, this monk took solid form to the point that it was walking around the camp and walking around the village. Oh and... As uh, as Alexandra decided to you know pack up and trek to another part of Tibet, uh, she noticed that whenever they made camp on their journey, uh, this monk would appear uh, that night wandering through the camp. And at first she was fascinated by it. However, this monk began to take on a, a different energetic tone. He began to look a little bit sinister. And he would sort of glare at her, and, and she started to become very uneasy. So she went back to the llamas again and said, you know what, I don't understand what's happening. And they said, oh, Tulpa, once it gains enough energy, can take on its own life and not be restricted or controlled by you. So that's what was happening with this Tulpa that she had created. It was taking on its, its own path, so to speak. And uh, she had to follow a whole separate process in order to disperse this energy before the thing came completely out of control. And uh, this idea uh, was introduced by Alexander in uh, some of her writings, as I referenced, but other people were pursuing similar things in the Western world. And they had the Theosophical, theosophical Society talking about thought forms, 
uh, you find similar ideas at different points around the world. This concept that our minds can project so much energy that it can build something wasn't that the, form at some point. Wasn't so that the concept? The, the basic concept of the culpa. Well, wasn't and, that uh, the, the concept as well? That concept, the yeah. idea of thought forms and sort of the interconnectedness of, of everything and, and all humans uh, and how we interact with the world around us and, and can alter and co-create things, positive or negative. Wasn't that the concept as well behind the moon child, uh, the Aleister Crowley idea of uh, the, uh, this, this um, I'm trying to think of the term right now, the moon child was what it was called, but it was basically an infant that was created under a particular uh, spell. Yeah, it's, it's a very similar, um, you know, Crowley just used a, a more ritualized, uh, Western ritualized process in order to create a, quote, moon child um, you know, he had studied a lot of the theosophical material and, and of course, the Golden Dawn and so forth. Yeah. And all of these people, the magical societies at that time, were really working at these ideas of, of thought forms. You know, a lot of these guys were attempting to create various degrees of thought forms in order to battle with each other and, and you know, vie for control and so forth. But uh, that is another, another similar version of the same concept, yes. And it would explain the development of the Slender Man. If you had, you know, huge amounts of people developing this creature throughout, you know, uh, chaos on the Internet, it could have Absolutely. taken its own form. And, <laughs> yeah. Jeez. Yeah, sure could. Yeah, it, it, it very well could be a, a modern type of that's being created inadvertently. Uh, you know, fear is a very strong emotion. And when you have people projecting a lot of fear into an idea, that something that is real or is going to happen or could happen, uh, that's that's a big field of energy to feed from. Absolutely. Wow. Very interesting. Well, that book really is going to be something to read. I'm going to look forward for that to come out, boy, David. In the final minutes here, David, um, let people know uh, where they can find you, your current activities. I note that you are going to be speaking out in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, at the uh, Paradigm Symposium, and I'd be remiss if we didn't mention that because uh, Michael and Mike and Scotty are, are friends of the show as well. Yeah, great guys. That uh, that is a, just a phenomenal event. The first year was last year was the first Paradigm Symposium. I was honored to speak uh, then, and they asked me to return again this year. And, in fact, I will be speaking on Tulpas this year. Uh, but the, the lineup is just amazing. It's one of the best events you'll find in the country. Um, gotcha. Robert Baval, L.A. Marzulli. Um, Robert Schock. Of course, Scotty, Scotty Roberts yeah. and, and Micah Hanks. Uh, Robert Schock, uh, Scott Walter from America on Earth. Uh, uh, Marie D. Jones, just an amazing lineup of people, and uh, well worth the trip for anybody who can possibly make it. And uh, yeah, if you if you happen to make it, you know, please come by and say hello. I love to meet people at events. I'll be in uh, San Antonio, Texas, on October fifth for an event there with my buddies, the Kling Brothers. Um, I will be speaking out in L.A. in November. Um, I show up all over the place. Best best way to follow me is. I have a blog at twoprosparanormal.blogspot.com. That is T-W-O-C-R-O-W-S, paranormal.blogspot.com. And uh, I post a, different, a wide range of different things on there, as well as information about upcoming events and so forth. And uh, there's a badge on there for my Facebook. People are welcome to friend me on Facebook. And I have a Twitter feed and all those great things. So, um, yeah, please check those things out. And the books are available directly from leprechaunpress.com and uh, that is uh, l-e-p-r-e-c-h-a-u-n press.com uh, so books are out and available now and uh, you can get them right there with PayPal David, it's been good having you on. I'm, the time was too short. we got to do this again sometime. Come back and uh, regale us with some more of the amazing stories. I noticed the chat room was kind of active. They were kind of blown away by thought forms, and uh, we came up with a name there, the homunculus. So uh, you spurred a lot of interesting thoughts and comments. So uh, you're welcome back here anytime, my friend. Great to talk to you. Sounds yeah. yeah, great, guys. Yeah, it be, be my pleasure. 
absolutely. I have a long list yet for you, David. <laughs> I didn't even get to them. <laughs> Of questions. We'll, 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 set, we'll set something else up at, uh, at, at your convenience in mind. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much. We're going to take a break here and come back on the other side. My guest, Alfred Lambermont Weber from Exopolitics.com, will be here. We're going to talk about Syria and we're going to talk about what's going on in the world. And uh, we'll do all of that when we return back from the break in about seven minutes. This is Off Planet Radio Live with Randy Moggins and Chris Holly. We will be. Right back. This is on Planet Radio. 